They say that there is someone out there for everyone. That your soulmate is just around the corner, waiting for destiny to bring you together. That no matter who you are or what you've done, love conquers all. So this Valentine's Day, let's, let's get a little bit romantic. Let's see what happened when one petty crook in particular found the one. A special someone that defined the rest of his life and captured the hearts and minds of not only him, but millions of others. They say that falling in love can soften even the hardest criminal by inspiring them to change their ways and become the good person that they really are deep down. Well, in this case, it had the opposite effect. Bonnie and Clyde. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get into the mad lad, this video is brought to you by Raycon. With Raycon earbuds you can optimise your listening experience with mind-blowing quality at half the price of other premium audio brands. The new everyday earbuds are upping the ante with an improved rubber material that looks and feels both sleek and discreet, as well as including comfortable but secure optimised gel tips to provide that perfect fit for maximum comfort and security regardless of the shape or size of your ears. Raycons are more versatile than ever, they have a built-in mic that allows you to take calls at the push of a button and they also offer 8 hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life and 48,000 5 star reviews. My Raycons are great for when I'm relaxing and also during my daily travels. So if you want to get some top tier earbuds while supporting my channel then click on the link in the description below or go to buyraycon.com slash dankula to get an exclusive deal of up to 15% off your order. Clyde Chestnut Barrow was born on the 24th of March 1909 as the fifth of seven children. From an early age, Clyde seemed destined for a life of hardship as he and his family had to move from Toledo, Texas to a slum in West Dallas in 1922 after a drought caused their farm to fail. But despite this hardship, Clyde seemed like a pretty normal kid with a love of music. He played the guitar and he also wanted to learn the saxophone. He also had aspirations of joining the US Navy, but unfortunately his application was rejected on medical grounds. If anyone's, if anyone's wondering why I look and sound tired, I've got, I've got, I've got a really, really bad cold. It's not, it's not, it's not the coof. It's not the coof. I've been tested. You know, sometimes you forget that other illnesses exist, but don't worry, it's not the coof. You're not, you're not getting rid of me that easily. Clyde's first brush with the law happened at Christmas in 1926, when he was arrested for auto theft. However, the charges were dropped when it turned out that all Clyde had done was forget to return the rental car. So, Clyde had just made a simple mistake. No harm done. Until the next incident. Unfortunately, Clyde's older brother, Ivan Buckbarrow, was a very bad influence on Clyde. Many people at the time were extremely poor and resorted to just taking what they needed, whether they could afford it or not, including Buck. And Clyde soon joined him in stealing things after he dropped out of school. Buck and Clyde were then arrested for possession of a truckload of stolen turkeys. Buck was imprisoned for a week, but luckily Clyde managed to avoid punishment. The law, however, had given Clyde a, a little bit of a scare, which should have been enough to shake him out of his brother's influence and set Clyde back on an honest path. However, all the ordeal managed to actually do was proved that Clyde was no chicken. 
Shuri. He did actually manage to hold down some legitimate jobs for a while, but on the side, he was also stealing cars with Buck. Then one night, the two brothers' fledgling career of petty thievery caught up to them in early 1929, when they decided to rob a store during a joyride in a car that they had stolen. Unfortunately, a squad car that was sitting nearby spotted them on their way out of the store. During the run from the cops, it was clear that Clyde wouldn't be able to outrun them. But that was all fine because he only needed to outrun his brother. Buck had actually tripped and fallen, so Clyde escaped into the woods while Buck was arrested. Luckily, despite abandoning his own brother, Buck was a good enough big bro to not rat Clyde out before being sent to Huntsville State Prison for a few years. And you would think such an event would have definitely been more than enough to scare Clyde shitless and put him back on the straight and narrow. The very next day, Clyde robbed another store. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, if he wanted to learn some lessons, he would have stayed in school. After several more months of robbing stores and stealing cars, Clyde's life changed forever in January of 1930, when he received word that his sister had broken her arm in a fall. She was staying at the house of a friend who was looking after her. So Clyde, to see if his sister was alright, decided to pay her a visit. But on that fateful day, his sister was not the one that had Clyde's attention. He was far too busy looking at his sister's friend who was making hot chocolate in the kitchen. And Clyde was immediately captivated by her. Bonnie Elizabeth Parker was born on the 1st of October 1910 in Rowena, Texas, as the second of three children. Her start in life was a bit of a mixed bag, as her father died when she was four. But, on the other hand, she excelled academically. In school, she was an award-winning honour student who wrote poetry on the side, and she also had dreams of becoming an actress. But... All of that went to shit when she fell for a man named Roy Thornton, who she married in September 1926, six days before her 16th birthday and after dropping out of high school. Because not having a dad does that sometimes. As you would expect from someone who married a 15-year-old, Thornton wasn't a good husband. He was an abusive drinker and was often absent for long periods of time until Bonnie eventually went, fuck this, and left him. Eventually, in January of 1929, Roy was sentenced to five years in prison for robbery. Seems that Bonnie had a type. Bonnie never actually divorced Thornton, but after he went to prison, he never entered her life again. Now, with that arsehole out of the way, Bonnie got a job as a waitress in Dallas while living with her mother. During this period of her life, Bonnie found herself terribly lonely and very frustrated by her ordinary life in Dallas. She desperately yearned for things to get more exciting, which is exactly what happened when she met Clyde. It was... Love at first sight for the both of them, and they talked all night. After that, the two were practically inseparable. Until they were separated. Sadly, Bonnie and Clyde's time together was short-lived. You see, Clyde was actually laying low when the two first met, because the cops were on to him for petty larcenies that he committed. And in February of 1930, he had to tell Bonnie that he needed to skip town before they caught up with him. Unfortunately for Clyde, the cops were closer than he realised, and he hadn't even finished packing before they were knocking on the door. He was arrested and sent to Waco County Prison for a two-year auto theft sentence. But it could have been much worse, as luckily the judge didn't really throw the book at Clyde. He also received 
a 12-year sentence for burglary that very luckily was suspended. However, despite Clyde being behind bars with an extra decade hanging over his head if he tried anything stupid, the authorities still couldn't keep these young lovers apart. Bonnie regularly visited Clyde in jail despite the objections of her mother. One day, she also got to meet Clyde's cellmate, a man called Frank Turner, where she got the chance to really affirm her love for Clyde. Turner told Bonnie that he had a plan to break himself and Clyde out of prison. And he only needed one little thing to do it. You know, just one tiny insignificant thing. A gun. He needed Bonnie to get him a gun. So he gave her directions to where she would find one stashed in his house. Now, this was clearly a non-starter. Who in their right mind would smuggle a gun into jail and then give it to one of the prisoners? What moron would do something so stupid, dangerous and extremely illegal right under the noses of the cops and prison guards, especially when it would get her boyfriend put away for an extra 12 years? Well, Bonnie would. And Bonnie did. Never underestimate the stupidity of horny teenagers. So Bonnie found the gun as directed, somehow got it into the jail, I don't want to think about how, and then gave it to Turner without anyone noticing. And then Turner did the rest. And surprisingly, it worked. Frank busted himself and Clyde out of the jail. And then they hit the road to Illinois, robbing stores and changing the license plates of the cars they stole as they went. However, despite their precautions, Clyde and Turner were recognised by a passerby that had one of their plates memorised. The snitch got them recaptured and sent back to Texas. And because Clyde fucked around, the book that he narrowly dodged before now smashed him right in the face, resulting in his suspended sentence being added to his time. Clyde was sent to Eastham Prison Farm for 14 years of hard labour, which sounds really bad just by itself, but Clyde was only 5 foot 7, and prison isn't a very good place for a delicate little thing like him. Especially since the guards also had a habit of just beating the shit out of the inmates. As you would expect, it wasn't long before a fellow inmate named Ed Crowder took a, took a little bit of a liking to Clyde. And let's just say that he made Clyde show him his muscles in an arrangement that left Clyde constantly getting shafted. Eventually, Clyde invited Ed Crowder into the showers and he got, to, he got to lay some pipe of his own. Yeah, Clyde beat him to death with a lead pipe. <laughs> Clyde, Clyde, Clyde beat him to death in the showers with a lead pipe. Now, that could have been the end for Clyde. However, a lifer took sympathy on Clyde and actually took the blame. He took the fall for the killing. After all, he was a lifer. What were they going to do? Give him more time. Unfortunately, Clyde's time in prison didn't get any better. By February of 1932, the prison labour was too much for him, even without the buck breaking. So, Clyde took drastic measures to get a transfer to a less horrendous prison on medical grounds. Now, we don't know if he did it himself or if he got a fellow inmate to do it for him, but Clyde had two of his toes chopped off with an axe. And six days later, this little piggy went home. Literally, because Clyde's mum had actually pleaded with the judge to make him eligible for parole after the two years that he had served. 
so it turned out that Clyde had chopped off his toes and gave himself a permanent limp for nothing. See, see if he just waited six days, you know, you live and you learn. But I don't think that the axe incident was the only reason why Clyde was walking funny on his way out of prison. Upon his release, one of the first things that Clyde did was reunite with Bonnie, who was pretty much the only thing that had kept Clyde going while he was in prison, by writing to him as regularly as possible. They even lied to the prison authorities about being married so that they would be allowed to stay in touch. Luckily, Bonnie hadn't forgotten about Clyde while he was away. In fact, their love only got stronger, as demonstrated by a letter that she wrote on Valentine's Day of 1930. And the letter said, Sugar, I never really knew I really cared for you until you got in jail. The rest of their correspondence was pretty similar in that it was full of romantic gestures, expressions of their yearning to see each other again, and all that other gay shit. It was clear that the two were very devoted to each other, and that Bonnie would stay by Clyde's side no matter what. But for Clyde, being on the outside with the woman of his dreams wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. The Great Depression was in full swing, so it was very hard for Clyde to find work, and whenever he did manage to get a job, it wouldn't last. Whenever some petty crime happened in the area, the cops would immediately assume it was Clyde, and then they would head to Clyde's place of work and pull him out for questioning. And the harassment from the law ended up getting so bad that all of his employers fired him, even though he had done nothing wrong. Can relate. Prison had changed Clyde. He was so hardened and embittered by his experience that a fellow inmate that he had befriended named Ralph Fultz said that he had seen him, and I quote, change from a schoolboy to a rattlesnake. So, it's no wonder that Clyde swore that he would never go back to jail, going as far as to say, no man but the undertaker will ever get me. If officers cripple me to where I see they'll take me alive, I'll take my own life. As you would expect, despite Bonnie encouraging Clyde to stay on the straight and narrow, he gave up after only two weeks, and he got back into crime alongside Fultz. But he wasn't just in it for the money. This was now personal. Clyde was so pissed off that he wanted revenge for the Great Depression and his time in prison, which had pretty much ruined his life. So he and Fultz, alongside a fellow criminal named Raymond Hamilton, hit the road together. And this was the start of what became known as the Barrow Gang. And like the leader of any gang, Clyde had a plan. And to carry it out, all he needed was faith and money. One day, once they had enough cash and firepower, they would go back to Eastham Prison, cause some carnage, kill the guards, and free all of the inmates as revenge for the horrible experience they all had there. But Clyde wasn't alone in this crusade. Bonnie was more than eager to join him in his crime spree. And on the 19th of April, 1932, the passionate lovers excitedly robbed a hardware store together. How romantic. While robbing the hardware store, Bonnie was loving the thrill of the action, but it suddenly started to get a bit too real when everything started going wrong. Clyde then tried to do the right thing by kicking Bonnie out of the car and telling her to get the bus home so that she didn't get tangled up in his mess. Unfortunately, Bonnie was arrested anyway, and so was Fultz. However, the jury 
refused to indict Bonnie. So she was released two months later on the 17th of June. Fultz, however, was not so lucky and he was sent back to prison. However, before Bonnie's release, things only got worse for the gang. On the 30th of April, 11 days after the botched hardware store job, Clyde and Hamilton hit a grocery store in Hillsborough, Texas. But before the safe could be opened, the owner, J.N. Butcher, was shot dead, and his wife identified Clyde as one of the shooters. Clyde knew that this was the point of no return, and he tried once more to do the honourable thing and offer Bonnie the choice of quitting while she was ahead so that she wouldn't join him in the electric chair if the worst were to happen. But Bonnie refused to leave him, even though the governor of Texas had issued a $250 bounty on her boyfriend's head. Now, being on the run for robbery and murder isn't exactly an ideal way to live. But the Barrow gang got by, robbing stores and gas stations as they went. Until the 5th of August, where things got a lot worse in Stringtown, Oklahoma. Clyde and Hamilton were at a local dance, getting drunk and having a good time. Until... Two cops, Sheriff C.G. Maxwell and Deputy Eugene C. Moore, noticed both of them swaying in a way that made it clear that they were both drunk. Prohibition was very much a thing at this time, so the cops approached them both to let them know that drinking was not allowed. And Clyde and Hamilton just immediately gunned them both down killing Moore and seriously wounding Maxwell. The gang then had to haul arse out of there in an escape that involved stealing and abandoning three cars. Now the hunt was really on, because if there's one thing that cops hate more than fake $20 bills, it's cop killers. The gang then went to visit Bonnie's aunt in New Mexico so that they could lay low. But while they were there, a cop looked up their car's plates because holidays were very expensive at the time and therefore cars from out of state were very, very rare. And surprise, surprise, the car had been reported as stolen. So... The cop approached the front door of Bonnie's aunt and immediately had a gun pointed in his face. Upon seeing the gun, Bonnie's aunt freaked out and called the cops. It seems that she was completely, absolutely unaware of the type of business her niece was involved in. So the Barrow gang once again had to hit the road taking the poor cop with them as a hostage, though he was later released unharmed. But not before the two lovebirds proudly identified themselves to him as Bonnie and Clyde. It must have really sucked to be Hamilton. Imagine being on the run from the law and the entire time you're the third wheel. The Barrow Gang continued on the road, living at campsites and shitty motels and probably also bribing people to keep them hidden. They kept robbing stores and gas stations to get by, shooting those that got in their way. Although one thing that made life a little bit easier for the gang was the fact that they carried out their robberies near state borders so that they could just quickly hop over and out of the jurisdiction of the cops that were chasing them. Despite being on the run, Clyde managed to stay in touch with his family and he would return to Dallas every so often to pay them a visit. Clyde's mum was sympathetic about her son's life of crime and understood that he was just in too deep. She and the rest of Clyde's family were always there for a reunion whenever Clyde returned to Dallas to visit. Clyde would write a note with a meeting time and place, put it in a cola bottle and then chuck it out of the window as he drove past his dad's filling station. 
His family would then meet him at the arranged location, often with food and clean clothes. But as wholesome as all of that sounds, Hamilton didn't have a particularly great reunion with his own family in Michigan. Because he got caught and arrested. And he was sentenced to 264 years at Eastern Prison Farm back in Texas. And this wouldn't be the worst luck that Bonnie and Clyde would go on to have when it came to the families of their associates. On Christmas Eve, a friend of Clyde named W.D. Jones joined the Barrow Gang, but he was more of a hindrance than a help. After having bragged about how many cars he had stolen, he had one job. Steal a car. Which is simple enough. After all, this was basic shit for Clyde. So, how did WD do with all of his professed experience? Well, well, he completely fucked it up, didn't he? He got into the car easily enough, which was sitting in a driveway. But he couldn't get it started. And he made so much noise that the owner of the car heard him, ran out of the house and started running towards the car. Clyde then had to get out of his own car and get the car started himself. And in the process of this, he accidentally shot the owner dead. By this point in their crime spree, Bonnie and Clyde were making enough noise that the feds wanted to get in in the action. But they couldn't actually do anything because it wasn't in their jurisdiction. However, Fed's gonna fed, so they got to work on finding an excuse to start meddling, which came in December of 1932, when they found an abandoned car in Michigan. The car had been stolen in Oklahoma, which led them to another abandoned and stolen car the following May. And inside of this car, they found a prescription bottle that was filled for Clyde's aunt. The cars had been traced back to Bonnie and Clyde, which meant one thing. They crossed state lines. So now, the feds were allowed to get involved. 1933 started in a pretty routine fashion for the Barrow Gang, as they continued to rob stores and kill the cops that tried to arrest them, with five smoked pigs under their belts. Oh, and they also, at one point, forced a cop, at gunpoint, to steal, carry, and install a car battery for them after theirs had died. In March, Clyde's brother Buck had been released from prison, and he joined the gang alongside his wife, Blanche. And together, they all decided to rent a garage apartment in Joplin, Missouri, and lay low for a few months. However, they barely even lasted one month. Their behaviour was suspicious enough that their neighbours called the cops, who showed up and noticed that all of the cars in the driveway were stolen. So, the cops decided to raid the place. On the 13th of April, Clyde and W.D. Jones were just back from casing some places to burgle when Buck met them outside just as the cops arrived. But the cops, at this point, had no idea they were dealing with the Barrow Gang. The cops thought that they had just stumbled across a bunch of basic bootleggers. And that lack of intelligence gathering cost them dearly. Clyde and WD wasted no time and blew the first two cops away with a shotgun, and Bonnie followed suit by firing an automatic rifle out of the kitchen window, and then Buck also joined in and opened fire on the cops. W.D. Jones was grazed across the head by a bullet, and Blanche lost her shit and just ran screaming into the street. She wasn't really cut out for this kind of lifestyle, and as the gunfight ensued, a bullet was deflected by a button on Clyde's suit, and Buck was grazed by a ricochet. 
After all of these extremely lucky close calls, Clyde managed to get everyone but Blanche into a car in the garage and set off slowly enough to drag a screaming Blanche inside the car before speeding off. It was a very narrow escape, but they'd all made it. However, there was something other than two dead cops that the gang had left behind during their escape. A little something that changed everything. A roll of undeveloped film. The cops also found Buck and Blanche's marriage license, Buck's three-week-old parole papers, and an autobiographical poem written by Bonnie titled The Story of Suicide Sal. After the raid in the apartment, the cops found that the film contained a number of photos of the gang. Now, to understand why these photos were so important, you need to understand that this was a time where the economy was in absolute shambles and those that couldn't afford to buy the dip needed a distraction because reading about the latest developments of the Great Depression was... Well, it was depressing. Which led to a series of sensationalised stories in the media about gangsters and crooks that the cops were hunting. And Bonnie and Clyde were no exception. The media wanted to run their story. And now, they had pictures. The photos and stories of their crime spree spread like wildfire. And the newspapers couldn't print them fast enough. The newspapers depicted Bonnie and Clyde as Depression-era Robin Hoods who were taking the fight to the banks and hitting the fat cats on Wall Street where it hurt. Sure, they were violent criminals, but the couple were living out a fantasy that everyone secretly had. After all, those bastards had it coming. And look at how in love Bonnie and Clyde are. How, how could you not want love to prevail like that? Also, what really added to the couple's image was this now very famous picture of Bonnie posing with a cigar in her mouth. And it really captured the imaginations of the masses because it was unladylike, rebellious, youthful, nihilistic and all of the other stuff that people look for in a girl boss. People thought that this picture had so much big dick energy that they assumed that Bonnie was actually the leader of the Barrow Gang and not Clyde. In addition to the boost to the Barrow Gang's infamy, the pictures also showed why Clyde liked Bonnie so much. Her 4 foot 10 frame made him look like less of a manlet. Bonnie and Clyde quickly found themselves as bona fide celebrities, alongside the likes of John Dillinger and Machine Gun Kelly, in what was known as the public enemy era. And people couldn't get enough of them. Their popularity was so huge that they became a big influence on the movie landscape. Movies about gangsters that were played by massive stars became so widespread that the authorities later get concerned by how classy and glamorous the depictions of such criminals ended up being on the silver screen, which partly gave rise to the infamous Hollywood Hayes Code. And the Hayes Code is something we'll actually be discussing soon in another video. So, the media had made Bonnie and Clyde romantic anti-heroes, blasting their way from bank to bank, sticking it to the man and also each other. But what was life on the run actually like for the couple? Not great, actually. It was pretty fucking miserable. <laughs> I mean, while depression angst was certainly a motivation for their crime spree and they did rob a few banks, the vast majority of their targets were small shops and gas stations. The robberies weren't even really planned out or coordinated either. They would just drive past one and go, oh, there's, there's one. And that, that, was, that, was, that was as much planning as they did. They would just run out of money while on the road, hit a store for a quick buck, keep running until they ran out of money again, find another store, possibly the first one that they came across, rinse and repeat, and they would usually make very little money from each robbery, often leaving stores with only about 
10 or 20 dollars which back then was was kind of a lot but it's, it's also not a lot Despite how much their real lives lacked the glamour of the headlines, Bonnie and Clyde liked the attention, and Clyde even fancied himself as a modern Jesse James, as he often went out of his way to avoid harming any innocent civilians, and that one cop that we talked about earlier. Not so much the guy in the driveway that was trying to stop WD from stealing his car, but, you know, that's by the by. Clyde would even throw a bone to the civilians that he kidnapped, like in the case of a mortician named H. Dillard Darby. On the 27th of April, Darby was eating lunch in a boarding house when he saw W.D. Jones stealing his car. Luckily, a nearby woman named Sophia Stone was kind enough to help him give chase in her own car. They made it two blocks before the rest of the Barrow gang pulled them over, kidnapping them both by forcing the two into their car and then driving off. Despite initially having their lives threatened, the tough guy facade was quickly dropped and the gang got talking with Darby and Sophia. And they all became genuinely friendly. So friendly, in fact, that the gang promised to release them unharmed. Sophia and Darby were released on a road just outside of Waldo, Arkansas, and the Barrow Gang sped off. However, the two couldn't celebrate their survival just yet because the car suddenly reversed and was heading straight towards them. Sophia and Darby panicked, thinking the gang had changed their minds. But the gang had come back just to give them money. Bonnie handed them five dollars to help them get home. And then Clyde promised Darby, since he was a mortician, that he could embalm his body in the event of his death. Now that was nice, wasn't it? That was very thoughtful of Bonnie and Clyde. I'm sure that Darby greatly appreciated the kind gesture. He never got his car back though. While the gang enjoyed the publicity and the legend that they were establishing for themselves, it did make their lives much harder. They kept getting recognised, which meant that staying in motels was out of the question, resulting in them needing to sleep in the car or at remote campsites. But I imagine that the worst part of all this fame was disappointing their fans. Upon discovering that Clyde was anything but larger than life, one person described him as, and I quote, nothing but a little bitty fart. <laughs> Imagine being famous for being not just a ruthless killer, but a ruthless cop killer. And the takeaway that people get when they meet you is simply, <laughs> manlet. By the summer of 1933, the Barrow Gang had split up for a while to do their own thing. And on the 8th of June, Bonnie, Clyde and W.D. Jones were on their way to meet back up with Buck and Blanche in Oklahoma when they had a car accident near Wellington, Texas. They were heading towards a river, unaware that the bridge had been removed. Clyde slammed on the brakes, but it was too late. The car swerved off the road and into the ravine. And then it burst into flames. Clyde and W.D. Jones got out unscathed, but Bonnie was thrown out of the window by the impact and pinned under the car as it rolled. Clyde and W.D. Jones managed to pull her out from under the wreckage, but the damage had been done. Bonnie's injuries were life-threatening. A nearby farmer who noticed the accident approached them to offer assistance. But then he recognised them. So he started running away to call the cops. So Clyde chased after the farmer, stopped him and then stole the farmer's car and then called a doctor before meeting up with Buck and Blanche in Arkansas. The rest of the Barrow gang went off to steal some quick cash, while Clyde never left Bonnie's side. 
Bonnie's sister then helped her with her recovery and she once gave a pretty grim description of her sister's injury. And she is quoted as saying, Bonnie's leg, all the muscle. She was burned to the bone on her calf of her leg. She never walked any more straight. She walked with a limp, a bad limp. She never got over that. Bonnie's injury was so bad that she could barely walk and Clyde often had to carry her. But nevertheless, once Bonnie recovered as well as she could, the gang was back on the road doing what they did best. On the 18th of July, 1933, the Barrow Gang stayed at the Red Crown Tourist Camp in Missouri, where the night clerk's suspicions were aroused by the sight of four heavily armed people carrying an injured Bonnie into their cabins. And because they just can't seem to catch a break, he called the cops. And you know what happened next. The cops came and a shootout started. However, this escape didn't go as well as the last one, and Buck took two bullets to the head. Blanche managed to push Buck into the car while Clyde carried Bonnie. W.D. Jones shot at the door of an armoured car that was blocking their path until it moved, and then Clyde started driving and burst through the garage and into the night. However, the cops kept shooting, shattering the glass windows of the car, which permanently blinded Blanche in her left eye. Once they were out of harm's way, Bonnie dressed the gang's wounds, until, to continue their stroke of sheer bad luck, they were spotted by a hunter, who again called the fucking cops. This time, the shooting was very much one-sided. Bonnie and Clyde both took bullets to the arm, but they and W.D. Jones managed to escape. Blanche and Buck, however, were too injured to go on, so they surrendered. Buck died in hospital with his mother by his side, and on the 30th of July, Blanche was imprisoned for 10 years. She later got parole after six years and managed to then go on to live a normal life. By this point, after so many close calls, W.D. Jones was just absolutely done with the criminal lifestyle. And he left Bonnie and Clyde in November of 1933. He was later captured by the cops and got a later sentence in exchange for giving intel on his former partners and claiming that Clyde had forced him to join them. Now alone and with the Barrow Gang gone, there was only Bonnie and Clyde, who ended the year with a series of near misses with the cops. Nevertheless, they were going to start 1934 with a bang. Even though the Barrow Gang had fallen apart, Bonnie and Clyde were now both crippled and the cops were hunting them with a greater fervour than ever, the couple were undeterred. While they still had each other, they could keep going. And it was time for one more big job. They may have lost the gang, but fortune favours the bold and they were on a mission and Clyde would be damned if that mission went unaccomplished. It was make or break time. At long last, Clyde was going to fulfil his vow. The target, Eastern Prison Farm. Bonnie and Clyde went back to Waldo, Texas to carry out their mission, where they enlisted the help of an old acquaintance of theirs who was incarcerated in the prison. Ray Hamilton. He was to be their inside man. They also enlisted the help of Ray's brother, Floyd, who wanted to break his brother out of prison. Floyd then visited Ray in prison to brief him on what the plan was. Bonnie, Clyde and Floyd then hid some guns in a ditch on the prison grounds, as the 
Convicts went out to work. An inmate named Joe Palmer retrieved the guns and slipped one to Ray Hamilton. Then, it was showtime. At around 7am on the 16th of January 1934, Palmer and Hamilton started shooting, killing a guard. They then ran through the fog towards the getaway car where Bonnie and Clyde were waiting. Palmer and Hamilton then made it into the car along with two other convicts, one of whom was Henry Methvin, who joined Bonnie and Clyde on the road. Now, Bonnie and Clyde were always a high-priority target, but this prison break got them on the cops' shit list in a much bigger way than ever. As a result, a posse was assembled to hunt the outlaws down once and for all, and this posse was led by a former Texas Ranger by the name of Frank Hamer. You know, the one with the big iron on his hip. However, Clyde did not make it easy for them. Clyde managed to avoid them with his impressive driving skills and choice of car. The Ford V8, which Clyde loved so much that he sent a letter to Henry Ford himself in April of 1934, which read, Dear Sir, while I still have got breath in my lungs, I will tell you what a dandy car you make. I have drove Fords exclusively when I could get away with one. For sustained speed and freedom from trouble, the Ford has got every other car skinned, and even if my business hasn't been strictly legal, it don't hurt anything to tell you what a fine car you got in the V8. Yours truly... Clyde Champion Barrow. I don't, I don't know what's funnier. The fact that he told Henry Ford how much he loves stealing his product or the fact that he signed his letter as fucking champion. By May, however, Bonnie and Clyde were beginning to run out of gas and they knew that the inevitable was coming. On the 6th of May, 1934, they paid a visit to their families, where Bonnie gave her mother a poem titled The Trail's End, the final stanza of which reads, Someday they'll go down together, they'll bury them side by side. To few it will be grief, to the law a relief, but it's death for Bonnie and Clyde. We've run out of fun shit now, boys. It only gets more depressing from here. Over time, Officer Frank Hamer figured out a pattern in the Barrow Gang's visits to their families, and he predicted where they would be next. And he had help. Henry Methvin's father, who had harboured Bonnie and Clyde at his farm in Louisiana before, was cooperating with the cops in exchange for amnesty for his son, with the Support of Methvin Sr. and knowing that Bonnie and Clyde would inevitably stop by, Officer Hamer was ready. On the 23rd of May 1934, Bonnie and Clyde were driving down a country road near the home of Henry Methvin's father, when they saw him at the side of the road seemingly having engine trouble. As expected, Clyde stopped to help the old man. And then it happened. Methvin Sr. dove under his truck and Hamer gave the order. It was an ambush. The entire posse emerged from the bushes by the side of the road and opened fire. The couple were absolutely riddled with bullets. At the ages of 23 and 25 respectively, Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow were killed instantly. Seriously, what, what the posse did was complete overkill. They just absolutely mag-dumped into the couple and their car. There was so much shooting that the entire posse was slightly deaf for a few hours afterwards. The car was left with 112 bullet holes. Clyde was hit 17 times and Bonnie took 26 bullets. 
Several of those were headshots, and Clyde's spinal column was completely severed. Now, that sounds bad, but the posse really couldn't have taken any chances. The car was absolutely loaded. There were over a dozen guns and several thousand rounds of ammunition in the car. There are pictures and videos of the aftermath of the ambush, but you can go and find that shit for yourselves. It's, uh, it's pretty grim. Bonnie died wearing the wedding ring from her marriage to Roy Thornton, who, after hearing about her death, he said, I'm glad they went out like they did. It's much better than being caught. And staying true to this perspective, Roy was also shot to death while trying to escape from prison three years later. Unfortunately, Clyde's ring had been destroyed a couple of years prior while he was in prison. Word of the ambush spread fast and a massive crowd had gathered at the Louisiana town where Bonnie and Clyde's bodies were taken. And saying that things got unruly would be an understatement. Souvenir hunters cut off locks of their hair and bloodstained bits of Bonnie's dress. Two guys even tried to cut off Clyde's ear and trigger finger before Officer Hamer and some other cops put a stop to this sheer degeneracy. Luckily, the bodies arrived at the Undertaker's intact, despite all of the attempts to cut bits off of them. But they were very hard to embalm because the fluid kept pouring out of all of the bullet holes. But luckily, it is said that our boy, the mortician, H. Dillard Darby, was up to the task that he was promised a year prior and he helped with getting Bonnie and Clyde ready for their final journeys, after he was called in to identify the bodies. Each of Bonnie and Clyde's funerals back home in Dallas were attended by over 10,000 people that had flocked to pay their respects. But sadly, there were two funerals. As much as the couple wanted to be buried together, Bonnie's mother didn't allow it. Having said, he had her in life, he wouldn't have her in death. So, Bonnie was buried in the Fish Trap Cemetery, and then moved in 1945 due to her grave being vandalised. She now rests in Crown Hill Cemetery. At her funeral, cards were allegedly sent by the famous criminals Pretty Boy Floyd and John Dillinger. She also received a massive floral tribute by a group of local newsies who sold over half a million papers in the aftermath of her death. Clyde was buried with his brother in Western Heights Cemetery, in a grave marked by an epitaph that he himself had suggested. Gone, but not forgotten. I mean, he's right, you know, like 100 years later and we're still talking about him, but that's... That's still kind of basic. More recently, Bonnie's niece and Clyde's nephew want to honour the couple's final wish of being buried next to each other. However, the costs of moving Bonnie seem to be too high to be feasible. But hopefully, one day, Bonnie and Clyde will be together once more. In the years following their deaths, Bonnie and Clyde have achieved folk hero status. Their story has been adapted into numerous media, including a very romanticised 1967 film titled Bonnie and Clyde, and starring Faye Dunaway and Warren Beatty, and also Netflix's The Highwaymen from 2019, which followed Frank Hamer and the Texas Rangers leading up to the infamous ambush. Speaking of which, if you want to see the bullet-riddled car that Bonnie and Clyde died in, as macabre as that is, you can. It's on display at Whiskey Pete's Casino in Prim. You know, that town in Nevada that people only know about because of Fallout New Vegas. And interestingly, many people that have been to see the deaf car have reported some very spooky vibes coming from it, as if it's haunted because they're fucking stupid. Sorry. Sorry, I hate that shit. With their status as American icons and all of the media that's been made about their lives, I suppose that, in a way, 
Bonnie's wish to have her name in lights came true. It's just a shame that it happened like this. Because she and Clyde really weren't what the world thought they were. The truth was much more tragic. Bonnie and Clyde's crimes were so small in scale that they wouldn't have been much more than yet another string of store robberies if the newspapers hadn't capitalised on those pictures and caused the public to hype them up. Many people saw them as cold-blooded killers when in reality they were just desperately trying to survive a period of great economic ruin. Though they didn't exactly go about it in the most ethical way, you know, at first it was kind of small time and then some really bad stuff happened and some people got shot and then it kind of snowballed and they got deeper and deeper to the point of, you know, well we can't stop now, we're going to get the chair anyway and I, I think things just got out from under them. So, in the end, the papers made a massive circus out of ordinary people for profit and the FBI went scorched earth on a couple of small timers purely out of spite. You know, journalists in three letter agencies, need I say more? What's quite amusing about the Barrow Gang's image is that Bonnie didn't actually smoke cigars. But for some reason, she was genuinely bothered by the fact that it became associated with her, even though she did smoke cigarettes. It bothered her so much that she would actually tell people that she met to tell everyone that she didn't actually smoke cigars. Because, you know, priorities. I mean, yeah, okay, I'm fine with being known for murder and robbery, but I draw the line at cigar smoking. In fact, the cigar smoking probably wasn't even the most misleading part of how she was depicted in all of the photos. The other misleading part was her holding a gun. Those pictures were most likely just her and Clyde messing around during some free time because none of the other gang members actually recalled ever seeing Bonnie fire a gun apart from that one police raid that went horribly wrong. This means that all of the modern media depictions of Bonnie, you know, just being all trigger happy and opening fire on cops with a Tommy gun and shooting anyone that so much as looks at her the wrong way are most likely all completely wrong. And it's also pretty likely, not 100% confirmed, but pretty likely that Bonnie never actually killed anyone. So, she wasn't really that much of a badass femme fatale. I mean, when she wasn't acting as a getaway driver, she was kinda just there. It is widely theorised that Bonnie suffered from hybristophilia, which is a sexual attraction to criminals, and it's commonly observed in the fucking wild fandoms of Ted Bundy and Richard Ramirez. And you know you know how serial killers get sent a bunch of love letters when they're in prison? Well, that's, that's hybristophilia. And considering both of the men that Bonnie had in her life, it's not hard to see how that theory came about. Some theorised reasons for how hybristophilia comes about include a lack of a father figure, so fatherless behaviour, wanting to share in the criminal spotlight, or a nurturing impulse. And what do you know? Bonnie turned out to be a clout chaser with daddy issues that said, I can fix him. In fact, she is such a famous case that hybristophilia is arguably best known as Bonnie and Clyde syndrome. Because there's no better sign of a healthy relationship than when your names become synonymous with a mental illness. So that we don't end on too sour a note, let's end by focusing on what really matters on Valentine's Day. Love. No matter how fucked up Bonnie and Clyde's story got, you can't deny that their passionate romance drove them more than anything else throughout their crime spree, to the point where they popularised the expression, ride or die. Now, that might be a little bit on the nose, regardless of how apt it is, but I suppose there's a lot to be said for the sheer amount of unconditional love that Bonnie and Clyde had for each other. And I think that everyone deserves to experience love like that 
at least once in their lives. And with the power of love, you can do anything. Well, except stop bullets. It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody subscribe! Right here.